important things you should keep in mind, midterm grades are posted now. Um, remember that the midterm grades only represent through roughly the sixth, seventh week. Um, so keep in mind that it excludes a lot of your project grades. So based on what you see in your grade book, it should give you a sense of where you were um, and what you might need to focus a little bit more time on. But there is a lot of opportunity for improvement based on the project grades. So this is the last lecture for EG1003. The rest of the semester, the lecture time slot is available for you to go to Open Lab if you want to, or work on the project in general. Next week is the last lab, Lab 11. Uh, after that lab, you'll have Open Lab sessions during that time. So it's available for you if you want to come in to work on the project. You can come in during those times. Uh, do you take advantage of that? Question? It's, it's like a regular open lab session. So if you want to go, it's available for you. Keep in mind, open lab is available seven days per week now. Uh, and we will also be sending out an announcement about Thanksgiving open lab times for those of you who are around. But do not feel pressured to go into open lab during Thanksgiving. Any other questions on that? As we're wrapping up the end of the semester? For project submission this semester, it'll be done on the EG website. If you go to the project submission tab, your team is given a specific username and password. This allows you to go back in and edit anything that you've submitted. So only your team has access to that username and password. Uh, but if you are submitting something and you want to update a particular file, then you can use that password to get back into it. And again, just another reminder that the RAD project competitions will be in the Makerspace on Tuesday and Pfizer on Thursday. Everybody is welcome to come, uh, support your friends that are in RAD teams, and be on the lookout for those of you in a RAD project that there will be an application if you are interested in presenting during that week. Okay, so a couple of things. I want to just wrap up what we're doing this semester. Um, Hopefully what you've gotten out of this course is an exposure to a variety of different aspects of engineering. One of the big focuses is on project management. Depending, regardless of what project you worked on, you all did very similar things in terms of having to develop CAD drawings, having to develop a schedule and a budget and manage a team throughout the entire semester. And these are the types of things that you can use to start to actually build your portfolio add to your resume as something that you've accomplished even within your first year. You've gone through a variety of labs that were designed to give you an exposure to the different disciplines within engineering and expose you to a, a number of different skills that you'll need, include computer-aided design as well as programming, um, for not only this class but for future classes that you're going to need to implement these things. And then, uh, as opposed to the, the planned lectures I showed earlier on, this is the tenth and final lecture for this semester. So we're giving you a, an overview of a wide variety of topics, including the different disciplines and majors that you can take here, as well as uh, a little bit about how this is applied in the industry, including project management um, and teamwork. So to wrap all of this up, uh, again, the rest of the semester is heavily focused on completing your projects. You've got one more lab. Uh, and then in recitation, you're going to be finishing up your live presentations as well as your, your final exam or your final presentation in the last week. But hopefully you had, uh, feel like this was a valuable course in, in exposing you to the different disciplines, introducing you to the professional skills of teamwork and project management, um, and also just in general time management to get you prepared for your courses over the next several semesters. I know there's a lot of work in EG1003, but that is to gear you up to be prepared in your second year as you enter some of your engineering coursework uh, to be ready for those assignments. So the last thing I want to mention, I haven't been uh, very stern about this this semester, but please be quiet when you're here in the lecture auditorium. If you're whispering to your friend next to you, it actually becomes very disturbing for, for everybody else that's in the auditorium as well as the presenters that are up here. So please don't talk, put your tech Put your cell phones away uh, and make sure that you're getting here on time. So I want to introduce Professor Maidenberg. He's in the chemical engineering department. If you can, please give him a warm welcome.
Professor Vandenberg. I'm in the chemical and biomolecular engineering department. Uh, so uh, while there's a B in the CBE, uh, the, we mostly focus on chemical engineering. That's, uh, that's the, the, the main venue of the department. Uh, and uh, just as you were just told, this course is actually great. It's going to gear you up to uh, I teach a design course, which is the last course you take in this class, in this major. Uh, I find this course to be quite good at giving you the skills needed for that course, for the senior course, which is uh, quite intensive uh, uh, on its own. So um, today I'd like to give you a little bit of a history lesson. So it'll be a little bit uh, in the beginning, a little bit of some history, social science, and then we'll dive right into the engineering and see why it's important. Uh, chemical engineering is uh, of the four traditional engineering disciplines. So we have electrical, ke uh, chemical, mechanical, uh, and civil. Uh, everything else that, that, that exists is sort of like an option of one of those or a combination of, of two of those uh, or is a section of those. Chemical engineering is uh, the newest of the four by a lot. Uh, and it's only about 100 years old, which sounds like a long time, but compared to civil engineering, that's been around since ancient times. So uh, it's very, very new. Uh, a lot of uh, things uh, have just been perfected. We're, we're learning them uh, at, you know, as we go along. Uh, there's a lot of exciting and new developments in chemical engineering, and I will show them to you. Uh, but before we start, I want to give you a little bit of a history of this and, see, and, and, and kind of show you why it is that we need chemical engineering uh, in, in the world today. And so uh, we'll start with the Industrial Revolution. So before the Industrial Revolution, there was not much of a need for chemical engineering. Uh, and before the Industrial Revolution, uh, people lived, people tended to live in smaller communities. Uh, that's not to say that there weren't cities. There were cities in places like Europe. Uh, but uh, by and large, people were much more rural. And they, they relied on resources that they had around them. So uh, you know, you go back, say, 1,000, 2,000 years, everywhere was like that. Uh, if you wanted apples and you lived somewhere that didn't have apples, well, you wouldn't have apples unless you, it was an exotic thing that you could see. Uh, people didn't have bananas everywhere. People didn't have pineapples everywhere. It wasn't so readily available. Uh, there were a lot of things that, were, that we have comfort, uh, comfort foods or comfort uh, products that just didn't exist back then because whatever you needed had to be produced locally. So uh, typically what would be done is you would have your own farm and you would grow whatever you needed for your family. Uh, and if there was some surplus, maybe you would, you would share it with the rest of the city or the rest of the town uh, or, or, uh, or, or maybe you'd sell it to some other towns around where you have some storage for later during years that have droughts or, uh, or anything like that. As we uh, advanced, uh, we kind of moved away from that uh, model. Uh, and now, and now if, if you brought someone from 2,000 years ago to today, they would not recognize communities anymore. We uh, live in, in larger, larger communities in big cities like New York City, and where we don't get our own foods, and we don't make our own clothes, and we don't do all these things. Uh, and we have to rely on others to do that. And the Industrial Revolution was really the beginning of that kind of transition. Uh, well, not the beginning, but like really the, the forceful uh, impetus that moved everyone away from that traditional model. And what really we cared about back then is to try to get things that we needed on a large scale. So before the Industrial Revolution, that's you know, around 1700 or so, uh, there were some different things that we needed, uh, uh, we call commodity chemicals. We still have commodity chemicals, and I'll get back to in a few minutes. But commodity chemicals like uh, sulfuric acid or potash or ammonia, does anyone know what, what they're needed for? Like what, was that? Yes, fertilizers, yes. So the commonality here, and back then, was fertilizers. Yes, we needed these things so we can grow food. So people would just store them on, 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 on fields and they would get, it, it would get more of a yield. So before, before the Industrial Revolution, it was kind of easier to get because you only needed enough to support your own farm. When the Industrial Revolution came around uh, and people moved into larger cities, uh, uh, we needed to produce more food to feed other people uh, in, in those larger cities. And not everyone in large cities would make their own food. So we obviously needed more of these uh, chemicals so we can make more food for the for, for, for a larger community. And what happened was that uh, uh, these, these 
these are Europeans at this point. What they would do is they would go around the world and they would extract uh, these uh, resources from other countries and other continents and they would bring it over to Europe so they could, they could grow and become more powerful and have larger empires and all these kind of things. So uh, in the name of empire, people came around and grabbed a bunch of these and uh, that's, that's how, uh, that's, that was the main drive for, uh, um, uh, for, these, for this empire growth and for colonialism. So that's how that started. And um, it, as you can see, uh, before, um, before they started importing them, they had some simple chemistry to make this. So if you wanted ammonia, uh, you would take guano and you expose it to hydrogen. Does anyone know what guano is? Yes, yes, it's bad and bird poop. So I have this thing, it's kind of hard to see it. But yes, it is. Uh, it is bird poop. And you take bird poop and you just kind of expose it to that and you get ammonia, which is uh, one of the most important commodity chemicals that we have in the world. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, so this is, this is what we had. In the 1700s, we relied on natural resources. Uh, in the 1800s, we started getting depleted because uh, we had larger towns, less people uh, making, uh, less people devoting their lives to agriculture, and we needed to, to make uh, food for all of them. So we needed to go find uh, uh, ways to import them. And in the 1850s, uh, we, we really needed more. We depleted the natural resources in a lot of areas, and we needed to come up with new and innovative ways to do this. Uh, and this is the beginning of the birth of chemical engineering. Uh, so, uh, well, before I get to that, um, with the guano as a little aside, uh, uh, a little aside uh, if you're aware of it or not, the need for guano and for ammonia was so vast that the, uh, the United States passed a law in the 1800s that any American uh, who sees an island anywhere in the world uh, that is unclaimed can claim it for the United States. And that's how we ended up with a ton of uninhabited islands in the Pacific, Island, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, because these places would be uh, 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 bird sanctuaries, or birds would go there and poop. And so you can extract, extract the guana there and bring it back home, and you, you sell the ammonia. And so a lot of places, a lot of, uh, um, say, like Midway Island in the Pacific, a lot of these large, uh, small, tiny uh, islands uh, had a presence of humans back in the 1800s. Now they're completely desolate. But it's just an interesting aside because it, it comes directly from this. So this, this is the person uh, most, most often credited with the birth of chemical engineering, uh, and George Davis. And he started the Society for Chemical Engineers. Uh, and really, the best way to think about chemical engineering is that it's uh, a combination of mechanical and uh, engineering and chemistry. So up until this point, like I said, we, de we depleted all these sources, resources, and now we needed to come up with new ways to make, say, ammonia. How do we make ammonia? So uh, let's say you have A plus B going to C to make ammonia in a lab. Uh, I want to not just make a little bit, because you've all seen labs, there's tiny little areas. I want to make one set that's large enough for, say, Brooklyn or for New York City. Uh, what do I do? So I need to scale it up. And that's, that's really the name of the game of chemical engineering. I need to scale up this chemistry. Okay? Uh, so what they did up until this point is they had a chemist uh, who was aware of the chemistry. Uh, well, if you take A and you mix it with B and you mix it around for whatever, how long, uh, some heat will come out and you have to make sure that you cool down and do all the chemistry things that you need to take care about. Uh, they need to uh, purify it and extract things and toss this stuff and all these different things. That's the person who's doing the chemistry. They're aware of the chemistry. Then on the flip side, you have the mechanical engineers who are more aware of scaling things up. Well, great, you're doing a lot, how do I scale this up? Uh, so then they came around and said, why do I need two people for one job, and so that, that's how we, we, we came, uh, that's how chemical engineering came around. We have one person who can speak chemistry uh, and can do engineering. And I say, and I mean it, speak chemistry. We learn chemistry, and is, if you are going to, if, to pursue chemical engineering or you're interested in chemical engineering, you will take a lot more chemistry than the other people uh, in, around. Uh, we take a ton of physics anyway, but we also need to take chemistry. So we have a whole year of organic chemistry, we have physical chemistry, we need to take biochemistry. 
These courses are not necessarily required for you to excel in the actual CBE courses that you'll be taking. They're not actually required for them. But it is required for you to be well-rounded because when you get out of here, you should be able to, like I said, speak to chemists. You should not be the one synthesizing these things. You should not be com coming up with A plus B going to C. But, he, but if a chemist comes to you and explains to you, well, I did this, I did this, I did this, and now you have to scale it up, you should be able to understand and converse with that person. And that's the reason that you're, you're learning this here, okay? So I know a lot of people are scared of chemistry. They think it's, it's hard. Um, and but that, that is kind of like the, the, the hurdle we have in the sophomore year. And afterwards, you're just doing a lot of physics and engineering. And you do do some chemistry, I'm not going to lie. But it's not, it's not, chemical engineers are not chemists. It's something that I still tell my mom and she doesn't believe me. So, we're not chemists. Uh, you could do chemistry, you could easily transition into chemistry, but you're not a chemist. So, uh, so that's how that came around. And you can see the, the first program that offered chemical engineering was UPenn in 1892, and it didn't come to MIT uh, until 1920. So it's less than 100 years ago. Uh, so that's fairly new. Uh, oops, it's kind of hard to see this again. Um, Haber. Anyone know Haber? Anyone? Yeah. Do you know what he did? Uh, he uh, came with the process of working in history. Yes, that's correct. Yes, exactly. Uh, and those of you who are, um, are interested, um, uh, if you listen to podcast and radio, Radio Lab has a, a wonderful episode on Haber and his life. And I'll, I'll mention it briefly. Uh, about his life. It's an, it's an, it is interesting. Uh, so Franz Haber uh, got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this. Uh, for this. Uh, so basically, the idea is that you can synthesize ammonia from air. This is one of the most major uh, uh, breakthroughs we had in the last century, and I'll show you in a graph why. Uh, this alone, this new chemical process, uh, is responsible for 4% of the natural gas used annually today. So think of all the things that, that we use gas for, you know, plastics to drive things around, to roll these things. 4% of all of the natural gas in the world is used just to create ammonia. We really need this. And it's nice and simple. It comes from air. All you need is really air. And then you need some heat. And uh, you don't really need to, to react more things. And I'll show you the reaction here. Uh, oh, this not it. So, well, then, this is it. You take uh, nitrogen and hydrogen, and you mix them together, and you get ammonia. So nitrogen comes from air, and you mix it with some hydrogen gas, and you do all these uh, funky things to it, and it eventually comes out of ammonia. Okay? Uh, and it allowed the population to go from 1.7 billion back when he was around to uh, more than seven today. Because now we have enough ammonia to, to go grow lots of food, and we can feed all, all people on, around the world. And that's how that started. And this is a traditional uh, way that a chemical engineer would see a chemical reaction. Okay? So a chemist would say, well, N triple bond N, whatever that is, H, bond H, they break, they break the bonds, they, they do a, a funky dance, and they come together, and they come up with NH3. And that's how a chemist uses. Okay? As a chemical engineer, it's, I, I need to understand that. I need to be able to, to, to speak with a chemist who figured it out or whatever. But I don't see it that way. I see them, these things as coming in. These are, these are my raw materials. I need to buy them. Okay? I need to purchase raw materials. I need to put this into some sort of process. Okay? And chemical engineers, a lot of times, when they, when they finish, when you, when you finish your, your four years here, uh, you usually typically be employed in large companies as a process engineer. So there's, there's no job called chemical engineer. I'm a chemical engineer at XYZ. That's not how it works. You could be a process engineer or a product engineer. And this is the process by which H2 and N2 become an H3. And it is up to you to design this process. So it comes into uh, what we have. We have uh, um, a reactor here, a catalyst beds, and we have a heater. So I got to heat it up, I suppose. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, get ammonia as a product here, but I'm, I'm not going to convert all of this. So a chemist would tell you, yeah, you're, you're going to get like whatever, 80% conversion. So for me, what that means is that I that 20% of it didn't get reacted. So I have to probably I could reuse this. Why not reuse the stuff that uh, that why why buy more if I still have it? So I can reduce the amount I have for purchasing here because I, I have stuff stuff that's not being reacted. So I keep recycling it. Uh, and then and we'll go into uh, the product here, we'll go into a heat exchanger, 
Uh, and then it will go into a condenser because now it's really hot, I can't use it. Uh, and uh, with some, um, it, it will then condense and, and I can, with the refrigerator unit, get my ammonia out. And I can do recycling and I can do heat exchanging as I need. You can see nothing really complicated here. I have a heat exchanger and I have a reactor uh, and that's all. So I have to apply some sort of heat source. I have to cool things down. I have to react them. Uh, this is how I view the reaction. I also have to see, as you can see here, when I'm trying to cool things down, I can't just cool them down, let, let, I can let them wait, I can wait a while until it's cool, I can do that. Uh, or I can just make it easier by using cold water from somewhere, and then, um, uh, and then they would exchange heat. The cold water that I'm using from somewhere is going to get hot, and the stuff that I care about is going to get cold. That's how a heat exchanger goes. And we have a whole course that should devote to heat exchangers and how heat exchange works. And we have a whole course that talks about, well, I'm flowing things coming from here, and it goes all the way to the end. How do things flow? There's fluid dynamics. So that's not us only. Mechanical engineers take that too, like I told you. Uh, we're, we are the marriage between the two. Uh, so we have to worry about that. We also have to worry about things like uh, um, thermodynamics. So you take courses on that. So you can see, this is basically all the courses that you'll be taking in CBE are for this to work, for you to understand how this would work. Okay? Uh, and the main drive, as I'll keep mentioning it, is economics. And you won't see it until, you, if, you take, if you're in CBE, until you see me in the senior year, uh, where we talk about how do we optimize the process so that the, wherever we're working, uh, or whatever we're trying to make, if it's our own product, how do we minimize the amount of money that we have to get in and maximize the profit, okay? And that goes with a whole lot of different things. So um, this is a little aside, uh, Haber process, the same Haber process allowed for the production of mustard gas in World War I, uh, and World War I was known as the first uh, chemical warfare war, it's the first time that people used chemicals to fight, uh, and he was uh, very much um, uh, a driver for that. And uh, I have here a quote from him, he actually believed that wholeheartedly. Uh, and when he came up with the Haber process, he did that for the world. And then during World War One, he was all wholly in, in, in the uh, uh, service of Germany. Uh, okay, so this is uh, one graph that's I think interesting to, to show you from a, from an agricultural perspective. From an agricultural perspective, this is for developing countries, uh, not for developed countries. So this is, these are places that have not yet industrialized fully. This is the amount of calories that they'll, people will be eating, um, say 1990, all the way to 2050. So this is, this is something that, the reason I'm showing this to you, to show you the growth of the agricultural sector and the need for chemical engineers to come up with new fertilizers or with new processes to make these fertilizers cheaper and easier to get. Because people need to feed a lot more people. As, as places like Africa uh, and, and South Asia are developing uh, and becoming more industrialized and up to power than everyone else, we will need to provide them with food. There's a lot of money, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of opportunity going into, into this. Uh, and this is the agribusiness. This is one of several sectors I will show you. Chemical engineers have, uh, we have the, we're fortunate enough that we can adapt to a variety of different ser services. So this is agricultural. We have a lot of other ones. But the, the main takeaway, as a chemical engineer graduate, what can you do with this? You can either uh, come up with new things through rich research and development, or you can take existing technologies like I just showed you, like this thing, and make this cheaper, easier, simpler, better. Optimize this. So those are the two things uh, that you will need to do. So. Uh, uh, as you can see, in the agribusiness, we will need pesticides, fertilizers, synthetic hormones, any growth agents, any other things that I didn't even think of. Lots of different things. Agriculture, it, it, it doesn't just, uh, it's not just plants. Agriculture is for livestock. Agriculture is for uh, the creation of anything that relies on plant-based or animal-based. So things like paper mills. We need fibers from places that we grow. So that's also part of agriculture. It's not just as uh, a traditional thing, I'm going to go grow an apple or a tree or something like that. So it, 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 these are big, big companies. Uh, one of the, some of the most 
profitable companies in the world are Monsanto and Makhtashim and BASF, and they completely focus on this kind of stuff. Well, BASF, no, but definitely Monsanto. And they're behind the scenes. You may not even know them, but they're very, very powerful, and they're very, very uh, lucrative to get positions in. All right. Another field, there's a traditional field that actually brought all this, is uh, um, the oil industry. I will not talk much about the oil industry, this is the only slide I have on it, but chemical engineers uh, traditionally have been employed predominantly by the oil industry, uh, and that they are focused down in the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, so Louisiana and Texas. Uh, and uh, big oil companies really like chemical engineers, uh, petroleum engineers, and they have a lot of money. Uh, and if you look at all those charts for people finishing uh, engineering, the people employed in the petroleum fields typically are the ones who, are, who earn the most. Uh, and because they have, they have deep pockets and they, uh, they have a lot of money to, to spare on that. Uh, and um, so, uh, as you can see, seven of the 10 most profitable companies in the world are in oil. So I'm not gonna speak much about that, but the idea here, again, uh, is to try to optimize the process. I can take oil out of the ground but I can't use it directly. I need to purify them. I need to separate the stuff into, say, methane and ethane and propane and all these different things. So as a chemical engineer, what you do is you design a way for you to separate this stuff uh, and then to transport this from Texas to New York uh, and uh, for people to use that. Um, so that's just one, one way that, the, that Exxon Mobil and all the other companies are using chemical engineers. You could also do some research and development. So what are alternate fuels? What can I do with fuels that's not traditionally being done? Can I make more plastics with it? Can I do all these other, other things? So that, that's, uh, again, the two things, are research and development or process engineering. Uh, and these are some companies, again, they're not local. I'll, I will point out when they're local, so you can see. There's a lot of stuff here, uh, but not, not yet. Uh, so polymers, that's another big important thing uh, that I'd like to discuss. So this is another interesting thing uh, that we all take for granted. Uh, we all take for granted that we can go to the store and get pineapple, uh, pineapples, but we, can also, we also take for granted plastics. Did you know that less than 100 years ago, there were no plastics? They just didn't exist. We didn't have plastics. And just look around. I can't think of things that don't have plastic. Everything has a reinforced with plastic. Your clothes have plastic. Your food has plastic. Uh, we, we, we make plastics, it's so cheap, it's so ubiquitous, uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's mind-boggling to think there was a time before that. Uh, so much so that when, you know, we divide the world into materials, uh, and so there's metals, uh, there is, there's these natural materials, there's ceramics, and there's polymers, four, about four uh, classes of material. So plastic takes up a whole different thing. And they are largely synthetic, but not all. And plastics are polymers. Polymers are large chains, and you've all seen it, I'm sure, in chemistry. So I have some uh, little little buddies here, they all hold hands, a little hard to see, but uh, basically they all look the same, and they hold hands, and that's what a polymer chain is. Okay, not all polymers are synthetic. Can you think of natural polymers that fit this kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, DNA, yeah, exactly. And sugars, proteins. DNA are nucleic acids, and a bunch of nucleic acids holding hands, and you can separate them. Complex carbs, you've heard that, you know, if you take complex carbs like uh, whole, whole wheat pasta, and you digest that, it will break into sugars, which is what the main, uh, the repeating units of sugars, they will make up uh, pasta. Uh, so these are natural polym uh, polymers. There's another one, rubber. There's natural rubber that comes from the tree sort of like maple syrup would come out of a tree. People use that in the Asian time to make rubber. Uh, and so there are some natural polymers, but they didn't know what it was. Uh, and so uh, I'm showing you Herman Mark, but I'm sure you've seen uh, his name around here. Uh, he was one of the people that, uh, that pioneered this study. Uh, and the father of, of polymers uh, was Wallace Carruthers, uh, and that was around the 1930s. So up until that point, any polymers that came around, plastics, natural polymers, all these things, they thought of it, funny enough, as a phase of matter. So they thought there was solid, liquid gas, and this weird thing, polymers. They didn't really know what it was. Uh, and it makes sense. I mean, you look at 
the problem is they're kind of like, uh, you look at a plastic, say a, a gum, uh, and you, if you hold it in place, it will kind of sag like a liquid, but you can kind of hold it and, and, and it has a hardness to it like a solid. So a lot of these things, like they kind of act as both solids and liquids, so they thought that. They didn't really know, they had no idea that these things have uh, their own na nature. Uh, and so, what happened with that uh, is another thing of resources, and World War II was a, a main impetus for the birth of polymer and chemistry. Uh, it, uh, we relied on rubber, on natural rubber, to make our uh, tires, uh, the United States, by the way. Uh, and during the war efforts, we were ramping up for war effort efforts, uh, we realized that we can't rely on, uh, on that. Uh, natural rubber came from Southeast Asia back then, and still does. Uh, and Japan was a main player down there, and uh, Japan and the United States were not really good friends back then, so they, the United States put a lot of money into research, researching how to find, how to create synthetic rubber so we don't have to rely on any natural resources. And it wasn't until Wallace Carruthers in, uh, uh, in DuPont, which is a big, big company, it's down in Delaware, not far from here, in Newark, Delaware, uh, and his, his lab, Purity Hall, uh, that he came up with a way to make that. Another one of his big things, well, some of the, he came up with neoprene, which you, you can see here, polyesters, you've all heard, I'm sure, uh, and polyamides, and uh, nylon. Major, major, major thing, and uh, to this day, DuPont is very proud of nylon, nylon 6.6. Uh, they came up with it, uh, and nylon changed the world. Uh, and I'm showing you here uh, some uses for nylon, you can see it here as in airbags. Uh, but I'm also showing you here the um, nylon uh, riots of the 1940s. So, uh, in women fashion, back in the 30s, uh, there was, uh, stockings was a new thing. And uh, stockings were made uh, with nylon. Uh, and it, it's cheap, it's durable, it's easy to make. Uh, and in the 1940s, there was a rationing going around, around because we needed it for war efforts. Uh, and you could see places like department stores would have it. Women would line the street to try to get the little bit that they had so they could purchase it. So it's just an interesting aside again. Polymers are ubiquitous. Uh, these things that you see on your products, um, these recycled things, they, they denote the type of polymer or plastic that is being, that is being used. Uh, and I'm showing you some of the uh, uses for, say, number four, which is low-density polyethylene. Uh, and this is high-density polyethylene. Uh, and what they're used for. So these are classes of polymers, uh, and this one is kind of worrying, purpling black hole. That's your blueberries and blueberry muffins. Really? So you're eating that, and because it has the same similar mouthfeel and texture to blueberries, so they, they put that into uh, muffins. Uh, but polymers are not just there. They're, they're not, not just in a lot of different foods. You might find it because it gives it a nice texture in your mouth that resembles the natural thing. So, uh, is it safe? I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it is what it is. Um, and so, yeah, so we can recycle in New York City one, two, and five, whatever that is, five. Okay? Uh, another a major thing that we do in design is try to figure out how to recycle the stuff for real. Because did you know that most of the plastics that you throw down in, in recycling doesn't get recycled? Did you know that? Did you know why? That's one thing. But suppose you toss really clean stuff. Let's say we roll nice and we clean all plastics. We should we, we don't. Why is it still not getting recycled? Yeah. Because China refused to recycle it. <laughs> there is that too. Because well, that, the reason China refuses it is for the same reason I'm trying to get at. Why? Why are we not recycling plastics? Yeah. It's not cost effective. Exactly. You know why? Oh, well, no, actually, what it is, is that making new plastic is cheaper than using old plastic. And plastic, as you recycle it, unlike glass, or unlike, uh, um, uh, yeah, unlike glass and metal, uh, it degrades. As you recycle it, recycle it, it degrades in, in, in its quality. So you can't use it to the same uh, extent. And also, impurities in it, you have multiple plastics, and it's really hard to separate plastics from one another. You may have one and two together, and two and five together, and two, five, and banana together. So it's really hard to separate all these things. 
and, and use them. So uh, that is, uh, that, and that's why China is refusing to take all the plastics. So up until not so long ago, they took it because they thought they could sell it. Now they have all this, all this plastic all over the world, and they don't know what to do with it. They just toss it. And you can see this like sad videos of, of, of little kids living in uh, in poverty in big big fields of plastic because they just tossed it all. And now they don't want to take it. I, I don't understand why. So one major thing that we we, we do in design uh, is try to think of ideas. Uh, how to recycle this more effectively uh, from a cost perspective, or if we don't do cost effective, what can we do with this? Because it's really becoming a big, big deal. Not just the impoverished communities in China, but we toss this stuff down the garbage, and it ends up in our oceans. And maybe you don't care about the oceans because you don't live in it, but as, as, it, as it gets degraded through the sun, the fish will eat some of the stuff. And maybe you don't care about the fish because you're not a fish, but some other big fish will eat that fish, and maybe a bird will eat that fish, and that bird will eat your plate, and then you'll eat that too. So if, if you're really, really, really selfish, it still will get to you. So even the most selfish of people should still think about ways to do this. It really affects all of us. These plastics, we don't know what they do for our health. Like I said, it's only, it's only about eight years old, these ideas of industrial plastics. We don't really know what this stuff does, completely. So. Uh, these are big chemical companies. Oh, it's hard to see. I have here the Lind Group. They're not local. I have Ebonic. They are local. DuPont is not so far away in Delaware. Uh, Dow is in the Midwest. Uh, but Dow and DuPont, they bought each other. And then they unbought each other. And they bought each other again or something. I don't know exactly what the, what the deal is. Uh, and then Sol Bay. That is local. These are companies that are researching new <coughs> methods of creating new plastics. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot of money going into this, this kind of field. Less than, less than, um, than the 30s and 40s and 50s when it was a new thing, but still, uh, as you can see, we don't know a lot of the stuff about this stuff, so we still are investigating. Okay. This is another big thing I'm sure you've heard about a bunch. Uh, nanotechnology. These are new materials, the same way that polymers work. Uh, we are investigating this new type of field, and chemical engineers are very much interested in this because they can scale things up and, learn, and, and use them for others. And uh, as you can see, it's very new. It wasn't until the 1990s and the early 2000s. It was about 20, 30 years old, this stuff. Uh, you know, about, about, uh, about as old as, as, as you are. Uh, and so this stuff is very new. We're still learning about this. Uh, nanotechnology is sort of like, well, nanomaterials, uh, the best way I can think of explaining it. Uh, you have chemistry on one end that learns, that studies um, small molecular things. So, you know, the, order, the scale of uh, a molecular bond, which is, you know, about uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 10 or 11. Okay? Then you have physics, Newtonian physics, you know, you could physics, you could think physics, you know, I push something and it goes down, uh, the, the, the laws of gravity and all these things that, you, that, you, that you're learning are affecting you. These things are not affecting atomic things that chemistry is learning, uh, is studying. But physics, uh, the, phys the physical laws and the physical universe does affect that. This thing, the nanotechnology, the nanomaterials, they're somewhere in the middle. So physics, sort of, the laws of physics uh, stop uh, taking hold around 10 to the minus 7 or 8. Uh, gravity doesn't have as much of a, uh, a pull uh, <coughs> down, down that scale. Uh, and so you get to a, an area, a gray area of you know, the, the nano, which is 10 to the negative 9 uh, nanometer, uh, so 10 to the negative 9 meter. That's the, the scale where both, both physics and chemistry things kind of marry together, and things are acting and behaving a little strangely. And so we are learning this new science as we're using this. So it's very exciting to kind of do research into like why this stuff is important, how does this stuff behave, how can I make more of it, how do I, how do I understand it better. So there's a lot of exciting research into like this fundamental science. But also in, from an engineering perspective, what can I do with all this new stuff? What can I do with all you know, fullerene and all these wonderful things that these things make? Uh, and that's, that's the interest of, of that's why people are so interested in this, because it is new and exciting, and we need expertise from different areas to understand this. Uh, <clears throat> as far as uh, chemical engineers are concerned, I'll show you some, some important applications that we look into. You can look at these. Uh, uh, the nanoscale is about the same size of a cell, and cells do behave in the same kind of way that, that I've just alluded to, somewhere between chemistry and physics. 
Uh, and so uh, I can talk about drug delivery. How do I deliver a drug? So let's say I took a pill and I want to target, say, my liver. How do I make sure it goes to my liver? Well, I can create a vehicle for it, like a little car. And it will drive around and get to where it needs to get to and then unload the drug there. And it won't unload in my stomach and it won't unload in my intestines. It will go directly to my liver and do its thing. And I can try to design this vehicle. Uh, what do I to put on it? You know, does it need to be an SUV? Does it need to be a four by four? I can do all these things. And what I mean by that, uh, you know, uh, your body, say for example, your immune system recognizes different things as friendly. So can I put friendly markers on it and so it won't recognize that as an enemy? Or can I put things on it so that um, it doesn't dissolve in the stomach acid and things like that? So really customize that vehicle. That's one one example. Another one is nanofiltration. Can I take can I, as, as you know, filters, they have filter boys, and then they filter things. As you know, the most rudimentary ones from play, playground, you put the little sieves and you filter things out of the sand. So if I make them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, can I get really, really small things out of my water and make it really clean? So nanofiltration is, a, is another uh, big thing you're looking into. And nanobots are some. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, here's, uh, I'm talking about nanoprocessors, but this is uh, the electronic industry. They're very interested in that as well. Uh, and so, uh, again, the roles of the chemical engineer would be research and development, as I mentioned, and then manufacturing. Here, because it's new, it's also how to characterize this. How do I know what this looks like? Uh, can I develop new ways to study this? So then this is really ripe with opportunities. Okay. This was a little funny joke, so I guess I can kind of read that, but it's true. Pharmaceuticals, major player, player in, uh, it's a major player in chemical engineering as well. And they are located, a lot of them, in northern New Jersey. Uh, there's a lot of facilities in northern New Jersey, and a lot of our graduates end up going there. Uh, and so, uh, the, the idea here is a good example of uh, aspirin. Back in the ancient, in ancient Greece, they realized that if they took willow bark and they exposed it to hot water and they drank it, they're, they're, they had to go away. They didn't know why. They didn't understand the biology of chemistry behind it. They just knew that that would happen. Uh, and it wasn't until 1829 that they isolated the actual active ingredient that does that, which is salicylic acid. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, around the turn of that last century that Bayer receives patent for making this on a large scale so we can sell it to everyone in the world. So it wasn't just enough. Here was enough. I understand salicylic acid is what's causing it. Great. Now I want to isolate salicylic acid uh, out of whatever it is, the willow bark. I don't want the other stuff in the willow bark. I only want salicylic acid. I don't want the other drunk. So I want to purify that out, take that out, and then I want to use that. So how do I purify that? And how do I make this enough for everyone in the world? Another uh, problem with this, salicylic acid broke into esophagus. So they had to actually modify that. So they had to they employ some chemists to modify what a salicylic acid would So it still acts the same, but uh, it's, it doesn't burn your esophagus. So uh, that's one thing that would happen. And so they there successfully uh, patented it and sold it. It became a big deal, big pharmaceutical. Uh, with a facility in New Jersey as well. Uh, so this is uh, the way traditionally drugs reach market, the market. Uh, some people think around uh, what to do. Uh, and then it has to go through a whole bunch of different things until it reaches FDA approval. It, it's fairly long. It takes about 20 years or so to get there. And you could take whole courses on this uh, regulation stuff. Uh, in the design class with me, uh, we do go over this for a bit. This could be talk about like who is the regulatory behind that, what are they looking for, uh, these kind of things. So it's, it's important to understand regulations as well. Uh, so as chemical engineers, you will be if you're interested in this, you you could be in, you could be doing research and development into new drugs uh, and how to deliver them, uh, or you could do stuff about formulation. How do I how do I scale it up? How to make it stable? How to make sure it doesn't burn the esophagus? All these types of things as far as the industrial scale is concerned. That's what we're specifically interested in. Okay, and these are a bunch of these big companies. And uh, let me see, Sanofi is local, Pfizer is local, uh, not anymore. Uh, Bayer is local, Johnson & Johnson is huge in New Jersey. GSK is in Philadelphia. Uh, Merck has a facility in New Jersey. And uh, I think Novartis is not far away from here also. Uh, the other ones are, are, a lot of them have facilities in the United States, like Lilly is in Indiana, I think, but they're kind of far away. But 
There's a lot of stuff here in New Jersey uh, for this, especially Johnson and Johnson. Uh, all right. I'll shift here something uh, that gets us. Let's see. Yeah. So in the interest of time, this is the, one, the last one I'll do. There's, there's other ones. There's also. Um, uh, uh, chemical engineers are also employed by companies like IBM uh, and Intel to help make large-scale uh, uh, circuits and uh, computer parts because uh, we do some chemical uh, treatments to create these things. So I'm not going to go over that, but that's also something that you may be interested in. IBM up in Albany and Washington County. Uh, okay, so this is a particular interest of mine because of my previous work. I used to work at Unilever. Anyone know Unilever? <laughs> okay. Like your parents were doing something, right? Like, <laughs> you're too excited. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good, good luck. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. So they're they're big manufacturers of lots of things. So Unilever, if you're not aware of them, if you do a quick Google uh, after class, it's it's a big U, big blue U. Uh, and if you look at, if you zoom in on that U, which you, once you see it, you'll, you'll see, you'll, you'll recognize that. It goes on a bunch of different uh, uh, products that you use. If you zoom in on that U, you will see tiny little logos of their composite companies. So they own a bunch of brands, and that's how they, they basically hide behind their brands. So they own Lipton, and they own uh, Dove Soap, and Axe, uh, and they used to own Skippy, and they own a bunch of different things, they're very, very large. Uh, and I think I have a picture here. I'll show you what they own in a few minutes. Uh, and basically, if, if Del Soap is doing terribly, it's not going to affect uh, Lipton Tea because no one associates it to it. That's the idea behind that. And they're, they're, they're a large company. Uh, and um, so I want to talk to you about, a bit about soap. Uh, soap is created by taking fats and exposing them to NaOH. Uh, and then the fatty acid salt is a surfactant. And a surfactant acts as a thing uh, that likes both oily things and watery things. So it can take stuff off of your skin and uh, uh, that water can't by itself take. So it will dissolve that and will go down the drain because it likes water. That's the simplest thing I can th I can think of this is describing this. Surfactants are used in other things too. Uh, wherever you're trying to mix oil and water when they don't want to mix. So we use surfactants to do that. Uh, so that just so. Uh, and you can, we can talk a whole lot about that. So, history of personal care. Uh, these are some, uh, some of the early uh, um, soap manufacturers uh, for the port sun sunlight in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is, let me see, how is this working well? Yeah, there you go. These are some old ads that they used back, I don't know, 60 years ago to uh, advertise personal care products. Okay. Uh, and um, they, they, their idea, basically, was to educate consumers. Uh, and when I worked at Unilever, it was a big thing that they kind of pushed us to do. We need to educate consumers to use our products. Uh, so I'll give you a major example of that. Did you know that about 100 years ago, about 120, I don't know exactly when, people didn't use deodorants? You had a smell about you, but nobody cared. Just everyone smells. So you want to put some water, whatever. But nobody really had deodorants and didn't exist. Well, personal care companies came around and said, well, we have this new product and you can be uh, attractive and business-like and all these things if you use our product, deodorant, and you won't smell anymore. And so much just so, they educated the, the consumers that it became this, this standard. Now, if you don't use it, you're the pariah. Right, you're the one who's looking crazy. Uh, you know, you, 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 you can talk about you behind behind the back, that kind of thing. So they really try to educate consumers on how to use things. And I use an example of something that I, I worked on that a bunch of uh, a bunch of girls in the audience probably know about this. I know when I started using when I started researching it, my uh, like my sister, my mom, my wife didn't know anything about it. Now they're using my cell water. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Yeah, biggest scam ever. So, my cell water is a makeup remover. Uh, and of course, they gave this bald guy, being charged of it, at least deliver this, but this is what I did. I worked on creation of my cell water for uh, Unilever. Uh, it was a product that came out of France. 
Uh, and the French always know what to do, so we should copy them. Because the, that's basically that's the idea as far as cosmetics go, right? So uh, it's supposed to be a makeup remover. If you look at regular soap, that's about 11 to 12 percent surfactant. That's that's the strength of it. Anything stronger is going to irritate you. Anything less than that, it's not going to do a good job. So micellar water is about 97, 8 percent water, 1 percent surfactant, and then some fragrances and things like that. That's it. And it feels good. It feels nice. It feels like water on your skin. You know why? Because it's just water. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. But they educated the consumers. This is great. This is coming out of France. It's a new thing. It's this and that. It's going to feel great on your skin. It's natural. It's got all these things. It's got, we put B12 in it. Who cares? It doesn't get absorbed. We've got to put B12 in it. All these things they, they tell you are great and important and they put them in and they educate the consumer to do that. And it's great. It's a marketing thing. It's a marketing driven field. The other things I showed you are not necessarily marketing driven. Market marketing driven. They're driven by consumers' needs. I need a new medication because my head hurts. I need, uh, I don't know, I need a computer because I'm trying to get things faster. This is not, this is something that uh, they're pushing on us and then we're using it. So these are some examples of uh, personal care products. Uh, I'm not going to diss soap completely because soap did stop a lot of epidemics and it's important to use. You should not not use soap. But the, to the effect that we need a special soap for our, our, our pinky fingers and for our noses, that's ridiculous. Skin is skin is skin is skin and you can use the same soap everywhere, okay? Iris spray on your face feels dry. You know why? Because you have more nerve endings. That dries your skin here too. You just don't feel it. So, do you really need a new facial, a facial soap? Well, I mean, if you don't, you don't need, because you don't know, I remember being on those shoes, I, I didn't know, I just didn't know. I was like, of course you need to use a facial, this and that, but you have to. I just didn't know. Well, if you don't use it, it's gonna dry your skin. I just, because you were not educated on that, we just assume that whatever is available is what we need. We don't need it. If you find a soap that's nice and moisturizing for your, skin, for your face, you can use it for your body, you can use it for your, hair, for your hair, it doesn't really matter as long as it works for you. So a lot of this stuff is nonsense, a lot of it is marketing. The marketing ads you see here, these are the modern ones, <laughs> similar. A little more PC, but similar. Okay? Uh, still. We're comparing ourselves to monkeys if we're not using this stuff. We're, uh, we're showing you nice, white, smiley faces, all these things, very much similar to what they had back then. This is what I, I meant to show you. So, uh, what is, this is Unilever. This is, I'm sure you've seen this if you, if you didn't know before. They own all this stuff. Coca-Cola owns all this stuff. So all these brands that you go to the supermarket to buy are owned by about, I don't know, eight to 12 companies, uh, really, behind the scenes, okay? As a, as, a, as a person who goes into personal care, or household, or food, which is all of these, the science and engineering is the same. You can transition from Coca-Cola to Unilever, the Heinz, and all these things. Uh, and you can be doing the same kind of stuff. Uh, researching things, uh, if you're interested in that, or scaling things up. If I want to make enough dump soap for everyone, what do I do? How do I, where do I put this kind of to do that? Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, so these are some we're doing for personal care industry. Yes, yeah, so this is some of the process I just mentioned. Um, okay. 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 So I want to show you. This is a bit outdated, but not so bad. Uh, I want to show you uh, employment of chemical engineers by area, uh, and also how much you can be making. So you can see uh, traditionally, like I, like I mentioned to you, oil industry will be here. Uh, and, and so you can see a lot of, a lot of uh, employment is down in the Gulf of Mexico. There was a lot of stuff here in the Northeast, uh, in the Midwest, in the Rust Belt, although that's waning. And you can see, like, a, like the Rust Belt is not doing well because a lot of the manufacturing was taken out and getting outsourced. And you can see chemical engineers are paid less in the Midwest, 59,000, uh, and much more in the Gulf of Mexico, about 107,000, 144,000, because of the shifting trend. But in our area, it's still pretty good. So in this area, it's still, it's still fairly, fairly good. Uh, a lot of people stay here. A lot of people go down to Texas, but I think most people stay here. Uh, oops, yeah. Uh, so this is the, our curriculum. Uh, so in the first two years, uh, as, as you all would do, uh, you take the fundamental physics and chemistry. I mentioned some of the chemistry that you've been taking in the first two years. Uh, and it's not until the junior year that you start taking the actual courses that are uh, uh, 
well, but you need to, to study all these things I mentioned. So, transport phenomena, that's liquid, how fluid, fluid mechanics, this is this. Uh, heat transfer, I mentioned before, we have to learn how things uh, exchange temperatures. Uh, and what do I do with all this hot water that I created? Do I just dump it on the ocean? Or is that going to kill fish? Uh, and mass transfer, that's how do things, how do um, the higher concentrations move to lower concentrations and why, and can they use it to my advantage? Uh, we talk about separation in a whole course. How do we separate things? So the, you might think to yourself, oh, I can easily separate things. If I have a mixture of something, I can just separate it with like a, a filter or something like that. Sometimes it's not so easy to, to, to filter. So here's an example, water and ethanol. We try to, to create high, uh, high percentage um, alcoholic drink. What do you do? Well, you might think I'm gonna, I'll heat it up. So I'll heat it up and I'll heat it up and heat it up. And the ethanol has a lower boiling point uh, than water. Ethanol is 78 uh, and water is 100 degrees Celsius. So you might think, yeah, well that makes sense. I'll just boil the water, all the ethanol, uh, collect it, and I'll have ethanol. But the thing that, the thing that happens is that at some point, there's a thing called the azeotrope, uh, azeotropic point, where the boiling point of the two coincides. So at a certain concentration, uh, boiling point, which is dependent on concentration, uh, they, will, they will coincide. And at some point, when you heat it up, you will get rid of both ethanol and water at the same time. So you're not going to be able to purify that. You cannot collect all the ethanol out of a water ethanol mixture. So what do you do? So this, what's that? There are different technologies, like, well, there's distillation, you've heard of that. But there's other technologies you can use. You can, say, freeze dry things. You can just freeze the ethanol out and take it out. Uh, you can add impurities to it. Uh, you could use some of the more radical separation things. So uh, you could use membranes to your advantage. Uh, you could use bioorganisms as well. Uh, not just for ethanol water, but this is the type of things that we study in separations. How do we separate things from new technology to old technology? And how do we do that uh, without breaking the bank? Uh, and then uh, reaction engineering. This is to study how what are the chemical reaction? How do I scale it up? What happens if I put that into a reactor? Uh, what kind of reactors are there? What do reactors do? Uh, so, sort of like an equipment type thing. Not, not the chemistry point of it, but the, the equipment of it. And how do I use that to my advantage to, to carry out what I need? Uh, unit operations, this is our senior lab. So like I mentioned, so let's have a separation unit, like distillation. I'm going to, you're going to be interfaced with a, a big distillation tower in the lab, and you're going to play around with it and study how it works and what happens if I flow things through it or if I heat it up or if I cool it down. All these things, and you start learning about the parameters line there. Or you, start, you look at a reactor. What's a reactor do? How do I play with the reactor? Okay? Uh, and this is my course, Process Synthesis and Design. Uh, this is what, what's called a capstone course. Capstone, if you look at an arch, it's the top stone that holds the whole arc together, you take it out, the whole thing falls apart. And the reason it's called that is because it takes all the stuff you learn in chemistry, physics, and engineering, and you're gonna do a big chemical, uh, sorry, uh, design project for the whole year, and you're gonna be learning about things like economics, about things like uh, uh, rigorous scientific uh, uh, vetting of a process, but also you're gonna be learning things about the current state of affairs. What, what do politics and politicians, and what do what does society uh, say about a certain thing? What do we need? need? Is, is there a need for something? Uh, are we trying to get somewhere? Uh, so, for example, um, there's a lot of push for, say, cleaning water. And how do we clean water? Or how do we recycle plastics? Or how do we... Uh, all these different things that, that are pushed by society, rightfully so. How do we do that? And where are they coming from? And how can I use it to my advantage? Uh, new ventures, new entrepreneurial ventures. We also look at, at the things like environment, safety, and health, uh, and also ethics. Anything that's unethical, uh, you should be able to flag it and say, well, I mean, legally I can do that, but should I do that, right? I mean, there are regulations in the United States. If I, 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 can't, I cannot dump hot water from a process into a, into a river, it will kill fish. But if I go and I do it in, say, Afghanistan, there are no regulations, but it's not ethical, should you do that? And what does it look like for consumers? Okay, so we, we, we study all these things. And we also have material science. Um, this is an example of a plant design that we did uh, two, three years ago. Uh, of, um, 
the Haber process, and we studied uh, a new, another method of doing the Haber process, and we optimized this thing here. As you can see, nitrogen and hydrogen come in, they, they, they go through a compression cycle, they have a heat exchanger, they have a reactor, uh, they again do, a, after they react, it, react it, we're trying to pull it down, and then we need to separate the stuff. We separate the stuff into ammonia, uh, and then stuff we can't use, we take out, and this stuff we can use, we bring back in as a recycle. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. These are the unit operations I mentioned. Uh, I think I'll just skip that. Um, and I think, I think I'll stop here. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. One last comment for this semester. Uh, keep in mind on the EG website, if you go to the lecture tab, you can download all of the lectures. The previous two weeks, the World Trade Center and the robotics lecture are not posted due to the content that was included in them. Um, however, we'll have this one posted up uh, later on this afternoon, so please take a look at those. Good luck the rest of the semester with your projects. And good luck to the
So you're set because you have a lot of AP threads, so you're probably really flexible. Um, you yeah. can probably get it back in track just setting up the right courses for the spring. Have you enrolled yet? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of more talking to the Okay. Maybe you want to shoot me an email and I'll let you know when I'm going to talk about it. Because I'm also going to buy it. Okay. <coughs> YM37. I think you'll really, you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, they restrict you. So, like, uh, if you if you go into like a, a more pure or R and D, which is grad school uh, or you know academia, mm -hmm. you you're more open to things. Uh, not as much not as much as you'd like, but much more open to things than you would be uh, in industry. So, in industry, they tell you you cannot study this. Like, if we you have, you're on deadline. You gotta get this stuff. But look, I found this new method to do this and that. I don't care. Do this and this and this. So you can't do that in industrial. <coughs> Usually, some places are more flexible, but uh, most that I've seen are not. You could be a mad scientist. Uh, <laughs> you can kind of run your own lab, or you can start your own company. But if you if you're running a lab, like say the professors are mad scientists in a way too, because you know they, they run their own labs at, at schools, and then they can come up with different things in the projects, and it's up for them to come up with the ideas. And they are driven by what's needed out there, but they are much more flexibility. <laughs> So, uh, so at the end of the four years, you have basically the option of, well, you have three options, I said. As you either go into industrial engineering, whatever your field is, you go into academic engineering, you know, it's grad school, or you don't do engineering, which is the answer. So um, if you go into graduate school and you go into your PhD, usually you have a project that you can work on um, and specialize in five years or something like that. Uh, and that kind of sets you into some sort of niche area, mm -hmm. but it's, that doesn't mean doesn't restrict you to, into some place. Yeah. So my mine was in nanotechnology and polymers, but I ended up in Unilever. Uh, I actually got interviewed by IBM. So it, that doesn't really restrict you to one area. Uh, but once once you start somewhere industrially, you usually kind of usually you tend to stay in that area for that's your expertise. Uh, but if you want to do a professorship, yeah, after your after your um, four or five years of PhD, uh, usually you go for a postdoc or something like that, mm -hmm. and um, it's like a year or two of research in some, someone else's lab. It's like an additional PhD without a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go and you get a position as a professor in one of those schools around. And over there you also have two options. You could go the route I chose, which is more teaching professorship, or you could do a, a research professorship, in which case you are more of a research professor, and then you don't teach as much, but you do a lot of research. You have your own lab, and you're running your own lab, and you have um, people working for you uh, and you're getting their own, their own PhDs. Mm -hmm. And you have undergrads and master's students also helping them around. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like a very broad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's not bad, though. 